Recording has started. Okay. Welcome to our little um, notes from the field in preparation for Saturday's trip uh, to Kiwanis Lake Rookery. Um, the format we're going to use uh, for the discussion, this is, again, it's open discussions. Um, I've got a few slides to kind of guide me through or guide us through so I don't, so Kurt and, uh, and myself uh, don't miss anything that we think is important. Um, be, feel free to ask questions anytime you want. Um, but before we get started, um, Joe would like to give us a brief overview of upcoming events. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Um, we as we have, of course, on uh, Saturday, this coming Saturday, we have the egrets, which you know, and that's why you're here. Uh, but on the, uh, the end of April, we're going to have a trip to the uh, Hershey Gardens for the tulips and for the butterfly house. And Elaine Shook has made arrangement with Michael Feldster to... Um, who is the photographer for the Butterfly House to give us some tips and tricks for that. That'll be really cool. And then we have, uh, I'm not going to give you the dates and stuff on this, but we have a trip, uh, Mary Fox and Eve Smith taking us on a photo walk in Lidditz and doing one in Italian Lake. And that'll be an interesting twist because they're going to do it in the evening time. It's a beautiful, beautiful place. Um, we have, of course, the Kiwanis Lake doing the, the feeding of the chicks. And that's on the 18th. We have that coming up. Elaine Shook is taking us down to Surrey Brook Farms, uh, Gardens, rather. And this is um, the most gorgeous place you'd ever want to see. It's fantastic. We have that coming up on a Saturday. And uh, for uh, presentations, we have uh, Alan uh, Ross, who was uh, Ansel Adams' Uh, assistant for five years and he drug his equipment up onto the mountains and they did the zone system and he has lots of stories about Ansel Adams and uh, and Alan in his own right is an excellent photographer and we have an interesting thing coming up uh, we had a lot of requests over year over the last past this last year to do a presentation on Milky Way photography. Well, around here, that's almost impossible to do, and we've tried it many times, and it was always a failure. so. So, what's happened? That's weird. Can you can you mute? Them? I'm sorry, folks. Oh, wait a minute. I got to turn this off. Okay. That was me. Oh, that was you. That was me. Okay. Um, so we have uh, Savannah, Savannah Della, Della is going to do a session for us on uh, night photography, Milky Way, particularly with some star trails in um, late June. So people that had travel like up into the Northeast, going to like Acadia or going out to out West where you have some good visibility. And she's gonna do a night photography 101 and give us the basics to be able to get that and provide a cheat sheet so you can take it out and uh, and you can actually get some really cool night shots. And, uh, but we're not gonna be doing that around here. So, because we don't, it's not conducive. And um, so those are some of the things we have coming up. I just wanted to mention a few of them like that. And uh, Mark, that's it. Yeah, thanks, Joe. And also don't forget this coming Monday is before and after. So oh, yeah. submit your pictures, submit them now. <laughs> okay, do you have many in yet, Mark? Um, I've only got two okay. so far. Um, right. But usually I get a rush on Friday afternoon and then yeah. I've got to spend a whole evening fixing them. So, but anyway, um, please submit them and, and, and uh, submit them early. All right. So again, uh, we're going to go through some things that will be of help. We hope to everybody um, uh, this coming uh, Saturday and in May for uh, photographing uh, at Kiwanis Lake. Um, any questions you have, please feel free to ask them. Um, we, I've got a few slides put together, but they're only there as a guide um, so that, again, so that we don't forget anything. The first thing is the good news. Um, they're there right now. This picture was taken this morning by Curtis. Um, 
while they were getting they were up there um starting to build their nest now so that's the good point so uh we, our timing seems to be very good this this year first thing i want to do real quick is to talk about logistics at kiwanis lake this is the lake it's in the city of york um we will meet um in the parking lot for the church it's an extremely short walk across the street to get to the rookery as you can see the rookery is on Curtis, I believe this is the north side, right? Yeah, that's the north side there. Yes. Okay, it's it's in it's in the trees, basically in the center of the on the north side. Also, the island itself um, has um, tends to where be where the night herons will be found. Okay, uh, it's pretty leveled. This area up through here, uh, in the uh, lower left, uh, is a sloping area, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, there's as, as well as the egrets and the herons. There's there's ducks. There's geese. There's people fishing. So it, it it's going to be a it's going to be a nice place. And the weather is supposed to be nice that day. So uh, we'll see um, how everything goes. First thing we wanted to talk about though was equipment, and um, and guys, you know, again, come in. You know, step in any time you want to uh, to add to these. Um, for the first thing is you know, the cameras, your cameras that you're using should be capable of a frame rate of about of at least five to ten shots per second um, to catch the birds in flight and in action. Um, faster is better, you know, as uh, so you can get even even uh, more shots to pick the perfect one. Um, lenses, you know, Mark, lens. Before you get before you get off of that, I want to ask. Yeah. Curtis, why do you use high frame rates when you're photographing like the birds in flight? Um, a lot of it has to be with the wing position. So nice. um, that allows you to get the uh, the wings maybe uh, horizontal or maybe elevated. Um, so yeah, that's why. Or maybe a wing is blocking the, the, uh, the bird's eyes. So yeah, that's why I use a high frame rate. Okay. Okay. Um, lens, appropriate lenses. Um, most zoom lenses will work just fine if they're in the uh, 70 to 200 plus range. Um, so the lens range is, you know, 200 millimeters to uh, 600 plus. Um, if you have like an Olympus with a 100 to 400, you got the equivalent of a 200 to 800 there. Um, and the lens hood is advised um, again, for obvious reasons of uh, blocking the sun and uh, less flare. And uh, if there's any precipitation, which I'm not expecting that day, um, they help, it helps protect from that. Uh, spare batteries and memory cards. Um, you can never have too many batteries, at least if you run a hungry a hungry uh, camera like I have. Mm -hmm. um, wet weather stuff, if needed. Um, you know, again, check the weather before we before you go out. Typically. I say typically a tripod or monopod is not needed um, for birds in flight because you're going to be moving around a lot. Um, but for um, but I know some people do like to use them. And by all means, if you like using them, go right ahead. Um, Curtis, um, Joe, do you have any comment on that? I, I have a comment on the uh, tripod monopod thing. Um, the first trip um, down there is going to be a uh, building of the nest. And these birds are going to be coming from all different angles. Some will be high, some low. Um, and it's kind of restrictive when you have your camera sitting on a tripod trying to get um, grab the bird, get focus on it. And uh, so it's much easier to be handheld in that situation. Um, the second trip, when we do in May on the 18th, that will be a feeding of the chicks. And that one, you're really going to be focusing on a nest. And that one, a, a tripod is very, very helpful. It's it, it it does get very tiresome if you have to try and hold your uh, camera there for a period of time, waiting for that uh, perfect uh, action shot. So, I think first trip uh, without a monopod or a tripod would be probably just fine. And the second trip, I think it would be uh, very uh, advantageous. Do you recommend a portable chair? <laughs> I will have mine. <laughs> <laughs> Enough said. <laughs> okay. Um, settings. Um, 
we recommend the widest aperture possible that you have on your camera uh, and the lens combination. Again, shallow depth of field, lets more light in, which leads to the next one, um, using high shutter speeds. Uh, anything less than a thousand, thousandth of a second um, might be tough for birds in flight. Um, sometimes you're not going to, you know, their wings are not going to be clear because your shutter speed's too low. I think somebody like Curtis or Joe might even recommend two thousandths of a second or faster. Comments, guys? Yeah, I'll jump in here. Um, we showed that photo that I took this morning. That was taken um, at one uh, thirty-two hundredth of a second, F8 at ISO 800. Um, it had a lot of light this morning. We had um, a very high cloud, uh, but it was bright. So uh, I like to be up there 3,200, even 4,000 uh, for uh, birds in flight. Okay, thank you. When I was photographing the eagles recently, um, I did not have really um, strong light. It was a very overcast light. So I was at uh, my widest opening was uh, five, six, and, uh, and I was at one, th two, 2,000 uh, to 3,200 for a shutter speed. And I let the and I let the ISO float, and I I controlled that manually uh, as I needed it. But uh, in that particular case, I had very fast moving birds, and uh, so then I would have to jack it, jack it up sometimes to one three thousandth, almost four thousandths of a second at times. And uh, so it depends. And I think you know, I think for these birds coming in, bringing the the branches is pretty easy steady flight it's not like a very erratic kind of a thing and uh so you might get away with a little bit but uh slower shutter speed but boy oh boy you check that on the back of the lcd and do that numerous times so you don't end up with a blurry image as it relates yeah. to shutter yeah. yeah you're not taking pictures of warblers here <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Okay, and the other thing, and again, I want your inputs, Joe and Kurt, uh, and that's uh, use the lowest possible ISO considering the settings that you're using. Um, yeah, I'll jump in. Um, with me, um, I would rather have a higher uh, shutter speed to eliminate uh, motion blur and have a higher ISO. Uh, the software out there now to, to take noise out of a photo is is great, um, but to take noise and blur out of a photo doesn't work too well. So get get your shutter speed up high enough that you eliminate the blur, and then we'll just let the software take care of the noise. Yeah, the um, the uh, the noise is part of Lightroom. I have found to be absolutely stellar in terms of removing noise. I just blown away with the quality of that, and I've compared it to other programs like uh, Topaz, Photo AI, and Sharpen. And I found that the one in Lightroom really does a spectacular job of that, so. Hey, Joe. Yes. Don Uvic, uh, could, could you comment a little bit more on that? Because I I agree with you, but I, I never know how to set the denoise option for uh, how I, I, for the for Lightroom, I, I, it's it's kind of like, I don't know if you just set it manually when you work with it or you you use no, the de no. denoise. No, I use uh, if you go into the detail setting and you ha and you have to have the latest version of Lightroom. Okay, I do. Yeah, if you do. If you go into the detail section, you will have you'll see denoise there, and it's right. called enhance. And when you click that, it'll give you a range of like zero to a hundred. Okay, right. And their default is 50. And I got to tell you, I frankly have never really changed it off of the 50. I just let it go. And uh, and I apply it. And it takes about maybe, you know, 20, 30 seconds, depends on the speed of your computer. And it'll come back with a DNG file, which right. is a negative. And, uh, and it'll just take the noise away. It's just, it's phenomenal. No, I concur. I concur. I concur. I, I... I went through the same procedure you did and found the exact same results. I left it at 50 and that's why I was asking. I mean, I never really 
adjusted that at all because it, like you just said, came out exactly the way I wanted it at 50%. So I took it initially, I took it like to 100% and tested that. Then I took it at 50. Then I took it at 25. And the 25, I could maybe see a little something that wasn't quite what I liked. But the 50 and the 100%, I, I couldn't tell the difference. So, and the good thing is you can batch process those. So you can select like 20 pictures and then do the noise and they'll do all 20. Now you go out and get a cup of coffee or a beer uh, and you can <laughs> back and it'll be done, but uh, it works really, really well. Great. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. All right. The next thing is autofocus. Um, autofocus AFC or continuous autofocus. Um, if your camera features tracking or bird tracking or something like that, that's also good to use. Um, I think uh, mine's pretty primitive, but uh, both Curtis and uh, Joe have uh, more advanced cameras than I have. And maybe you guys can comment on the tracking features. Kurt, you want to do that? Sure. Yeah, um, yeah I do. I, I have um, animal eye and it, it will lock on to the bird's eye and, um, just makes life uh, really uh, simple. Uh, but if you don't have that, uh, you're going to probably be using one of the small zones and uh, possibly the uh, one that has a, a single point with eight helpers around it. That usually works well. Uh, if the bird is a, against the a sky background rather than uh, trees, you might try one of the larger zones and that should grab the bird pretty easily as well. Um, and we haven't spoken about this, but if you have back button focus and uh, uh, you want to use it, uh, please do. I think I really like it. Um, and Joe, if you have any comments. No, that's that's good. Okay. Next item we recommend is shooting in raw. Because if you have something that's slightly overexposed or slightly underexposed, you can uh, correct it and you can be um, a little more creative in your, in your post-processing. Um, auto white balance is probably the best bet because you're going to be birds in flight are going to be up against the sky. Auto white balance typically works very well there. And the next item I'm going to let Curtis talk about, and that's using you know, recommending manual exposure. Sure, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll try and tackle this one. Um, I use manual exposure exclusively for birds in flight. Um, the birds are normally flying. Um, unobstructed. They're not going underneath a canopy of trees or anything like that. So the light that hits the bird is always the same regardless of the background. So as the bird flies in front of trees, that background is dark. And as, as it leaves the trees, it might go to an open sky and then the, the background is bright. And if you use one of the auto ones, uh, that means that your camera is using its own meter and it's changing your exposure and your bird will go say from a dark if it's in front of the sky and maybe real bright if it happens to be against those trees. So um, using a manual exposure mode that unlocks that meter from the camera and when you find the exposure for the subject in this case the bird you it's locked in you're ready to go it doesn't matter what background brightness uh, the bird flies in front of, the bird will always be exposed correctly. And uh, and when we get there, and if you want to try it, if you're one that's using one of the auto modes, which might be um, shutter priority or aperture priority, or even manual with auto ISO, that is an auto mode. Uh, and you want to try just a straight uh, manual, <laughs> I'm sure, I'd be more than happy to help you out on the next Saturday. That is I don't know what that sound's coming from. Uh, maybe why don't we go it looks like it's Spike Spilker? Okay, right here. I'm uh, I'm trying to it's not like Mike's trying to speak and distorted somehow. I'm trying to. Um, I don't know. You're going to have to turn off the helium, whoever has that running in their room. 
<laughs> yeah, I just muted. I just muted Spike, and it seems to have stopped. Okay, good. All right. So, so Mike, if you need to talk, you got to hit the space bar. Okay. The other thing, um, under the under the bullet manual exposure, um, there's a website. And that's a it's a YouTube video that Curtis found that uh, is a really good illustration of why to use manual exposure when you're shooting birds in flight. So I would recommend it's it's a pretty short. It's about 10, 15 minutes. Um, I think it's uh, worthwhile for everybody to take a look at. Uh, Mark, this question came in uh, while you were talking there uh, from Spike. And maybe, uh, Curtis, it's a take on what you mentioned. Uh, how to catch the bird to get the exposure? Uh, hold on a second. Hold on. Before, before we, that's a good question, Joe, but that's technique. That's the oh. next slide. <laughs> okay. So I have with a that, question then, can I ask a question, Mark? Uh, I guess. <laughs> um, either Curtis or Joe, when when you're using manual exposure, since the birds we're dealing with are going to be white, are you planning to underexpose a bit, or are you going to try and hit it right on the button, or or what are you going to do with that? Okay, Mike, you're talking. Hold on a second. You're talking technique. Okay, uh, could you hold that off your answer until the next slide? I, I'll try. I'll try my best. Okay, we've gone to the next slide. Okay, my That's question. Right. Was... Okay, um, go. Let's let's start at the bottom then. Um, uh, Curtis, uh, sure. Take take test shots. White yes. birds on dark backgrounds. Yeah, take a test shot of. Uh, the egret, and uh, you want to look for um, your uh, blinkies if you have them turned on. Um, and what I normally do is I'll just keep um, changing my exposure until I find the the blinkies. And I like on a, a white bird like the egrets, I usually like to underexpose at least a third of a stop. And uh, that way we're pro really uh, protecting the highlights there. We can get some detail uh, out of those feathers. If we try and nail it right on, sometimes we're going to be a little bit too hot and uh, those uh, uh, details are a little compromised. Okay. Uh, Curtis, do you use zebra? Do you have zebras in your camera too? No, no zoo animals in mine. Um, okay. mine's, just, mine's just blinkies. <laughs> <laughs> okay, because I use, I use zebras. My, my camera's got the zebras. And if you set the zebras up right, it can do the same thing as blinkies. And it does it, you know, right in the camera for you. And you can see it very easily. Um, so I tend to do that. Uh, let's, I have let's a question go. then. For your for your use of zebras, is that live? Is that yes? Okay. Whereas blinkies is not in my world. Uh yeah. we actually have to take the shot and then review the shot. Yeah, I can actually I can actually see it live and I adjust my my ISO in this in, in this case being in manual, I adjust the ISO to the blink keys are gone or just about gone. And then I have the right exposure. But blinkies, but zebras are a little more complex to set up than zebras. I mean than blinkies, because you've got to you gotta set up at what level you want them to show at and that kind of thing. Um I'll rich I'll make a comment on the uh on the test shots and the white birds and the and yeah. the blinkies. There, if there's one thing over the years I have seen in going to uh, Kiwanis Lake is when somebody has an overexposed uh, head on a, a bird, if it's white, it actually absolutely 100% is a throwaway because you cannot bring that detail back. And what will happen is that you're going to have like a mush of white and you get this thing called blooming and that means that it'll sort of like glow and it'll just be horrible uh so it's really that's a, a really critical point to me anyways is to make sure that i never ever if i can possibly have it uh, overexpose the uh the uh the birds uh and that's hard sometimes when you have a bunch of birds and you're tracking them and go doo, 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 yep. and then you have to stop every now and just check to make sure yeah thank you joe uh again the other thing is that, you know 
chimp to check exposure and focus. And for those who don't know what chimping is, that means look at your LCD screen on the back and make sure you're in focus and not overexposed. Um, Mark, going back Mark, to the I top, can see, I can see why you called this technical because we're discussing chimps and blinkies and zebras, very <laughs> technical language. So good choice there. Well, zebras are technical. <laughs> <laughs> Understood. And, and on that point, uh, Mike, I want to tell you that sometimes the feathers come off of the bird and when they fly in, in the, and the white feather may be in against a blue background and there's a feather there, some people might consider that to be a dust spot or an air. I consider that feather to be part of nature. Yeah, I, I, it's right. artistic choice, definitely. We're going to get into that <laughs> next, Michael. <laughs> okay, so general rules, again, general rules. Have the, have the light and the wind to your back. The light coming right onto the bird um, really highlights the bird. Um, shoot loose, crop later, as um, Mike would like, would Mike would say. Shallow depth of field that isolates the subject from the background and the foreground. So um, you get more separation. The next things we're going to talk about after now that we've gone through this is kind of um, more the artistic, artistic stuff and the things you can do. Um, you know, this is this picture here that that um, Curtis did. This is this is a classic picture uh, from there. And it's really nice. Uh, but there's other things you can do at, um, excuse me, at Kiwanis Lake. And um, so look for different backgrounds. Um, again, here's a, here's a shot of a bird uh, bringing nesting material with the nice blue sky background. And the one below it, that's a heron. I think it was taken the same day. I'd have to look it up. Um, against a, a dark background. Um, use the terrain to your advantage. Um, go back to here for a second. That bird was flying from here, from the rookery, over to the corner here in the left-hand side. I happen to notice that these are all pine trees through here. And by getting over here and climbing up the hill part way, I could get to just about eye level with a dark background. So look for those kind of things. Look for other opportunities than just pointing the camera up in the air and shooting. Um, there's there's plenty of opportunities for this kind of stuff there. Um, another thing, lighting and posing. Again, we we talked about having the having the light to our back. Um, this first shot on the left is pretty much the lightest to our back, but the one on the right hand side, he's it's it's definitely side lit. This was taken um, on what would be the net on what we're going to call a nesting trip, the May trip. Uh, this was taken about that time. You were there. I met you there that that day, Curtis. So you yeah. can get some nice side light shoot shots in there too, and, and still get some decent isolation. You can also use those tree branches to frame your subject too. Yep. So, so think about that as well. Yeah, so there's it's not just shooting against the blue sky there. There's there's other opportunities and you can get uh different views. Um the other thing is is there's more there than egrets. That island I showed you in the map, these both of these guys were on the were were on the island. And the light was coming in from the uh southeast, if I remember right, and it just Lift this guy up nice. I got a nice expression out of this one. Wish I could have isolated him a little better, but got a nice expression out of him. So these guys can be uh, can be a good shot, and they're much closer. And they're almost naturally at eye level sitting in those bushes. And the last thing is there's much more than just the plants. I mean, than just the birds. The plants and the landscaping there is very nice. Um, this time of year, you'll um, they'll they have plantings there of tulips and irises and that kind of stuff, and and some of that should be blooming also. So you should be able to take um, pictures of that. But this picture was I don't remember who took this. It was one of our club members. Um, I should have looked it up. Um, I but, did. Uh, oh, you took this one. Okay, mm -hmm. this was last year, right, or a year before? Two years ago. 
years ago. This is a really mm -hmm. nice shot. So, so that's all we had. That's all I had as far as structured stuff goes. So if there's any questions, let loose, guys. Okay. And I'm going to, well, questions are coming up. Uh, I'm going to make a comment about the have the wind to your back. And that's an important concept. Uh, whenever you travel and you're going to be photographing birds, you want to have the wind to your back because almost always the birds take off just like airplanes do into the wind. So if the wind is in your back and it's going towards the bird, the bird's going to come in and take off in front of you. If you, if you have the wind coming from the opposite direction and the birds are going to then have their back to you and they're going to take off into the wind, but they're going to be, um, uh, they're going to, you're going to get the back end of the bird. And uh, so that's, that I think is something for me when I was, when I'm out photographing, if I have a, like a round lake and I'm looking to see how I'm going to photograph it, I look at the wind first to see where it's going to be. Like just on there, like on Saturday, it's see where it says the meat here. Okay. That's big. And that's where the, the sun's coming from, from the right to the left. Then if you look at where the rookery is, you have the rookery and see the uh, green uh, tree right above the word rookery onto the left a little bit. That's where the wind's coming from in that direction, coming down to the, 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 um, uh, to the lake. So we're in a really good position for that because the birds are going to be flying from the left side, basically, of the lake over to where the rookery is. And, and you're, we're going to have a good, it, it'll be a good line for that. And, and also, guys, don't forget to look in this area in here where these trees are. There's typically no um, nesting there, but a lot of times you'll find egrets in there picking up material for nesting. So they'll be pretty close to you. And I've also seen night herons up in there. Kurt, how, um, do, you, how do you determine, Kurt, if a bird's going to take off? Well, normally, it's like you say, Joe, they're going to take off into the wind. Um, here at the rookery, they're going to be dropping out of these trees um, and swooping down and then gathering uh, nasty material and then they come back in. And um, you just have to watch their pattern, their flight pattern. How's that? And see how they're dealing with it because they're going they're going back to where they, they dropped out of the tree. So, um, so the wind, it can be a problem for them as well because they're trying to get back to, uh, to their nesting site. Um, I have a, a, a comment here. When you yeah. come and you want to, um, say, try manual exposure, make sure you're familiar with your camera on how to adjust shutter speed, aperture, uh, and your ISO. Know how to do that quickly, okay? Be familiar with your camera. Know, know it before you get there. Uh, when you're there, that's not the time to try and figure that out. Everything's happening quickly. And you want to be able to uh, make adjustments. And, and the purpose of the trip is to get those birds, you know, get those images. So know your camera. Kurt, um, are, you, are you going to be using a polarizer? I will not. You will not. And why wouldn't you use one? Because uh, I'm using a big lens. <laughs> and I um, can't get one to, to fit. <laughs> All right. Okay. I had a question for Kurt. Uh, the, the photos you took that we were looking at, the egrets, what lens are those shot from? That one there, I, I shot with my um, a 600 with a tail converter on it. So I was, um, I was at 840 and actually that bird filled the frame. So it's difficult at that focal length yeah. to uh, not clip the wings off. Um, so uh, 600 is good, 500 is good. Um, that, these that two one here, up the upper left, that might have been right, maybe a 500 or something. The, these two here were okay. shot with uh, five with a 100 to 400 with a 1.4 teleconverter on them. Oh, and thank they, you. They, and they were both cropped. Hey, this is Don Uvic. Yeah. Hey, can you guys talk a little bit about tracking? Um, for example, um, I know it's, Curtis made that excellent comment about clipping wings, um, and I, I kind of have a strategy of my own. You know, you know, having more of a pulled out uh, 
full full uh my i don't have it zoomed out right away when i see the bird far in the distance but maybe, can you talk about that i don't know how many people are familiar with being able to track and try to minimize clipping the wings as the bird's approaching because you can't keep it just at the zoomed level all the time if you want to get a sequence of the bird coming in and landing um since i'm shooting with a prime i cannot zoom back and find a bird so my technique is i watched the direction so if the bird is is flying from left to right i will then um uh, uh bring my my lens up and I'll let the bird fly into my frame. I'm not trying to find the bird. I'm not taking that lens and I'm shaking it all over the place trying to find that bird. I'm looking at the path that the bird is taking. And then I line my camera up in front of that path. And then as the bird, all of a sudden, whoop, here it comes. And, I, and I, that's how I capture um, the tracking of that bird is I, I let him fly into my frame and then I start tracking him. Now, there are other people that are maybe have a zoom lens and maybe they're wide and maybe they zoom in after they've uh, isolated the bird in the frame. But uh, with a prime, I don't have that. Uh, I, I can speak on the on the zoom when when we were Thanks, in Joe. Al we were in Alaska, the uh, four of us had uh, zoom lenses and two of them had prime lenses. And the ones that had the prime lenses ended up not using them. And they would then use their zoom lens. And what we would do is we would see as eagle, we got a pattern where it was, and then we would zoom out to get it. And then we would slowly zoom in, not too slowly, slowly zoom in to get him into the frame. And if he got too close, we would zoom out. OK, so that's how we were trying to avoid the clipping using the zoom function. And when we did that, however, we wanted to make sure that we really increased our shutter speed because now I have elements moving, going from close to far away. And that would that's going to really make you have to have a very fast shutter speed to avoid that movement of the lens elements. But that worked out really well for us because the birds may be farther out and then as they got closer, we were able to zoom out. Whereas the guys that had the prime, uh, the folks that had the prime were in a disadvantage and then they would have two bodies and then they'd have to switch them and do it very, very quickly. And then of course, at that point in time, the birds were moving so fast, they would they would miss it. So I, I found that a zoom for me anyways is, um, is what I, I found to be really, really good. Thank Curtis. Thank you, Curtis. Thank you, Joe. That that is helpful. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Is there anything in chat? Oh, recommended uh, media card speed. Boy, that's a tough one because it depends on your camera in terms of how fast it can write to a card. For instance, if you use a an SD card as an example. Uh, you're not going to get a really, really fast generally in an SD card. But if you use a compact flash, you can get pretty fast cards. And fast being defined as how fast the data can read from the camera to the media card. And you just have to look at them. I go to B&H and look at the read speed and the write speed. And you want one uh, that can be relatively fast. But I... So that would be what I would recommend you do is look in the kind of a card you have, go to like a B and H, and then look to see what the fastest card is. If in fact you felt you needed the fastest card. Now I use um, a very fast camera and um, with like a 600 millimeter lens type thing. And I don't use the fastest cards out there because I have a buffer in the camera that will buffer my images. So I'll go hold the shutter, go down, and I'll go do 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 do. Okay, and then I'll let it go, and then it'll it'll be writing those um, images to the card. And I think on this particular outings that we're going to be having, I don't think that the media card, and I, and I have to caution this based upon the kind of camera you have and what kind of card you're going to use in the format. Like, is it an SD? Is it a Compact Express, Compact Flash? Um, but generally, I don't think the speed of the card is a real determiner on this particular kind of a trip. 
you go and do, um, uh, but I'm not butterflies, but uh, hummingbirds. Okay. That's a different story because you're going to be going at a fast, fast rate as you can possibly go. And you're going to take maybe 50 pictures of the hummingbird to try and get the wings in the right position at a very fast shutter speed. And there you're going to be writing out a lot of images to your card and you might need a faster one. I don't know, Sherry, if that helped at all or not. Um, yes, it did. Thank you. Yeah, Joe, another another aspect to that that you brought up that I think is very important is you need to kind of know what the buffer rate is on your uh, on your camera. I mean, some cameras like mine, I can only I can only buffer like 34 raw files. So I can fill it up fairly. I can fill the buffer up very fast. So I shoot in short bursts. OK, other people who have got large buffers in their camera, they can shoot almost forever right. and the thing will keep up with them. So it so Jackie, you also have to know your camera too. Uh, Jim uh, Jim Berlinger, are you on yet? Yes, sir. Okay, the camera you have the uh, the one that you had the D five hundred. Yep. Okay, that one could do about two hundred uh, uh, shots in in the buffer in that particular camera, as an example. Okay, now okay. that's highly unusual for a camera to do that, but that particular camera was built with that capability. And I remember once we were in Africa and people, I was, people say, how come you're, you know, you're able to get all those shots? And I says, well, basically it can go forever. And they said, nah, well, you know, they don't believe oh, it. We, so I yeah. it, down. it went on forever. Okay. <laughs> and uh, so it, it really depends on your camera. And that's an excellent point, Mark, about the buffer. Um, yeah. I, I, I have a question for uh, Kurt, if you don't mind. So, uh, Kurt, you had mentioned you underexposed by a third, uh, offset the blinkies. And is that uh, pr done pre-shot? I'm sorry, do you, you know, you actually preset the underexposure on your camera manually for that uh, shot that you're going to be taking? Yeah, you're going to be taking your test shot and then yep. you're going to review that. And if you're using uh, straight manual exposure, you'll make your adjustment. Um, if you're doing one of the auto ones, you'll probably be going to be using exposure compensation. But regardless, you're going to review. You're going to look for the blankies. If you have them, you're going to underexpose. I usually go at least a third of a stop. You want to make sure that you protect those highlights because these birds are dominantly white. And that's uh, that's what you're after here is to get some feather detail out of these shots. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, are you guys shooting in manual mode? Yeah, yeah. we'll be uh, most of manual us exposure. Are yep, manual exposure. And Joe, I have a question for you. When we shoot a lot of uh, pictures at a time, our camera gets hot. The Z8. Any suggestions? Well, when you say it gets hot, uh, now I've used the Z8 extensively, and I don't know what you mean by getting hot. You get a warning saying saying it's hot. Oh, okay. You're like you're out in the sun, and uh, and and it actually heats up. Um, uh, do I have a? I, I've never encountered that myself uh, ever, and. Uh, so I don't know how I would um, avoid that other than not keeping the camera in the sun. If you're not like in the, out in the desert Southwest and, uh, and you're out there all day long, I, I, I don't know. Uh, the Z9 doesn't do that either. So uh, we were in Scotland and we were getting it over there. Wow. We were there. Um, I think the end of, I went with Terry and Jill at the end of August into September. Hmm. Have you updated the firmware in that camera? Oh, well, I didn't yet, but I will. I will when I go down to my daughter's house. She'll help me do it. Well, I think that it, was that was before the update. Yeah, and that could also be a function. It could be a function of the memory card. Uh, it could be. Now I don't want to go into any details, but I, I it could be a function. Now, what memory card are you using? Do you know? I was using Sand Sandisk. Okay, and you're using and we're using the Compact Express, the new ones. Yeah. Okay, well, you should be okay. I don't know. How about using 
if using a third party battery, would that have any influence I, on heating up the camera? I've been using Nikon. Yeah. And Marlene, the best solution is to shoot film. <laughs> Use a pinhole camera. <laughs> Any other questions, comments? Well, thank you for doing this for us. I appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. We're happy to do this. I hope people got some ideas out of it. Well, well without we'll any more there. without any more comments or questions, um, I want to thank everyone for for joining us. And uh, I'm going to sign off now. Okay. Good night. Thank, thank you. you. Well, thank you. Good night. Thanks, guys. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye now. Uh, Mark, uh, Joan, yeah. asks if she can, if she can have a copy of the slides, would you be able to uh, make a PDF of those? And I have it? a P. You've you've got a PDF. I sent it to you. Okay. If you have well, a email. well, actually, you know what? Uh, the copy of the slides is basically what we had in the announcement. Uh, on the was it's a copy of that really? That yes, it's, it is. So it, the, this just has the illustrations in it and that. Right. But um, I would I would suggest that um, that we just look at the email that was sent out and it has all the things about polarizers and batteries and all that. Okay, in it. sounds okay. good. So, um, I mean, Joe, I'd like to send you the link to that Whistling Wings photography, uh, his explanation on uh, manual exposure for birds in flight. And if you could put that in that uh, email. Uh, Follow up is that something that can be done? Yeah, we can. Won't you uh, send that to both Mark and I? Because Mark's going to be doing that email for tomorrow with the recording in it. Uh, I have Mark should have it. Okay. Yeah, I have it. Then send it to me. Then okay, I would like to see that. Okay, folks. Okay, Joe, I'm going to I'm going to give you a call right after the meeting. Okay. Just for a couple of minutes. Okay. Bye Sounds now. Good. Okay. Thank you guys. Thanks. Take care.